it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to introduce Shelley Austin. Uh, Shelley is the president of Intech Freight and Logistics. She graduated from Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis with a bachelor's degree in business. And then she went to Penn State to finish her associate certificate in logistics and supply chain management. Uh, one of the, I mean, there's a, there's a long resume I have here, but one of the things I want to highlight is that she has several, several outstanding intermodal industry achievements, was recognized as Progressive Railroading's rising star. Uh, in the fourth quarter of 2016, Shelley Austin and Rick Lagore created Intech Freight and Logistics through the acquisition of several companies. So without further ado, Shelley Austin. Good morning. Well, thank you for everybody for being here and coming out on the mo this morning. Um, the first thing I have to ask is, did everybody have a good Valentine's Day? So I found it all interesting that we were coming to speak right after Valentine's Day. But one of the things, I'm not really a big Valentine's Day kind of gal. So I got asked to write an article for 3PL Perspectives. And I'm like, yes, I can do that. And they're like, planes, trains, automobiles, tell me what you want me to write about. They're like Valentine's Day. So, um, you know, when looking at this, I thought, okay, well, I really don't like the holiday. And it's not because I don't love my husband or my kids or anything like that. It's because I think it's gotten to the point where it's a retail holiday where they just try and push everybody to spend more money. And so I, I took the perspective of looking at it in a business sense. So in logistics, it's a pretty cool holiday. So if you think about it, you've what are the three biggest things that people buy for Valentine's Day? You've got flowers, you've got jewelry, and you've got chocolates. Well, think about the logistics behind that. So the logistics behind getting two of those commodities are temperature controlled, and one of them is the biggest high theft item. And then you have to get it all to the stores right at the right time to be on the shelves for everybody to buy. So the article then took its place in to describe all that. So, you know, it, it changed my perspective on Valentine's Day. So as we were talking, Intech Freight and Logistics, we're a 3PL. We are a third-party logistics company. I, I consider us a control tower. We do anything from you know, technology, different things in, in regards to running planes, trains, and automobiles. We focus a lot on trains, uh, do a lot of intermodal. Um, and right now, we're selling a lot of our technology work. So when I was asked to speak on ethical supply chains, I had to think about it. Is there an ethical one? Um, but, the, you know, there, there are, and Dr. Iyer said a lot of interesting things that point to what we're going to talk about here. The first thing I wanted to, I always look up a definition when I'm going to speak about something. So I looked up ethical, and then I got a few little quotes from a few of my friends um, in the industry. So the one that, uh, I mean, you can read, I don't have to read to you, but I really like the second one from Jeff Brashears. It's, regardless of your position in logistics and transportation, ethics is the most important trait that lives with you for a lifetime. You want to look in the mirror every day and say, today I did all of the things right. In business, you only win if both sides win. So I, we find that to be very important because in transportation and logistics, there's so many parties involved. And Dr. R mentioned a lot of that. Is there? I don't know about you guys, but um, after his speech, I'm not sure anybody really wants to be in logistics and make a decision because you're going to be liable. Um, and it, it, you know, that used to get me a lot in this industry. I was very afraid. I used to be a buyer of transportation, um, kind of on the shipper side of the world. And then when I got into being a provider of transportation, it made me very nervous about the liability that we had when helping people move from point A to point B. So in looking at that, I wanted to figure out, OK, is it lack of good ethics, or is it maybe just a little bit of lack of knowledge? And that creates bad decisions that makes it look like a bad ethical de um, decision. So I really want to believe that most of it is just gaps in knowledge and not so much bad ethics. So wh when we're talking about, and again, I'm going to focus mostly on point A to point B transportation. I don't get much into the warehousing or the sourcing of goods, but we do play a part in that. So when I think about areas within the industry that people th ask about or question bad ethics, the first one that always comes to play is pricing. You know, when we're looking at pricing, it, it, you see different things in the industry where people will say, well, I don't want to leave money on the table. 
well, I want to see how much money I can get, or I want to see how much money I can not, you know, how, how little I can get that for. And everybody's looking at the margin and, and what the, the uh, delta is, and they're not thinking about the end customer service and what, how that's going to affect what happens on the end. So pricing is a big factor. And in transportation, one of the things that I wanted to point out is where does that instability come from? Why, do every, why does everybody feel that? And in transportation there, it has really changed from prior years. And I don't want to date myself. I do highlight pretty well. But um, so, you know, when I first started in transportation, you did have some regularity. There were some predictable ebbs and flows within the transportation industry. So in pricing, you could kind of work with that and you would know how you were going to annually price for different things in the transportation market. Well, a lot of things have happened recently that have just radically changed that to where you cannot predict anything. And it is impacted the behaviors and, and nature of people within the network. So some of the things that I want to talk about that have created this erratic behavior, it dates back to um, the hurricanes of 2017. So I think we all remember these hurricanes that just kept hitting and pounding within the domestic US. And on our side, as we were helping customers control their transportation costs and get capacity, all of these trucks not only were if a hurricane was occurring, you couldn't get in that area so that you know, deliveries weren't happening there. And believe it or not, there were customers that wondered why. Um, but you know, the other thing is you couldn't get capacity because if it weren't for the fact that they couldn't go in there, all of the trucks and all of the equipment was being used for FEMA. So you, you couldn't get something for a common good situation because rightfully so, the capacity was going to help. And that created this massive craziness within the transportation industry, not only just trucks, but trains and everything. It just went erratic. And the cost to get transportation flew way up. So anybody in a transportation management role, they had to explain to their executives why they were spending 25% over their budget because of this one situation that happened. So then everybody thought, OK, well, it's going to even itself out. It'll level out. It's OK. Well, no, as you can tell, it didn't level out because right after everything started to clear up from the hurricanes, then we go into ELDs. And so I'm not sure if everybody knows what ELDs are, but there, it was a mandate on the electronic logging devices for trucking. And so what it did was a lot of our trucking in the domestic US are owner operators. And rightfully so, um, to their nature and to their pocketbooks, they were pressing the, the laws a little bit on their logging devices. And so they were churning and burning and running hours, and it was great for everybody that was buying transportation because they were getting things done and keeping things moving. Well, it wasn't very safe. Um, so you don't want a driver out there that's been driving for hours and hours and hours, and you're out there in a car with your family, and they get fatigued, and everybody's seen it. I've seen it when you're on the road, and you see a truck kind of swerving back and forth. So the ELDs got into place, which literally took it to, to the point of all the trucking companies had to implement this, and if they were driving too long or past a certain amount of hours, it would shut down the truck. So no longer were the days of pushing the barrier and pushing out. So what did that do? That reduced the capacity for trucking. So you know, we went from the hurricanes, we settled down a little bit, we came back up, prices dropped a little bit more, and then ELDs went into place, and it just went crazy again. Prices went way up. Nobody could get a truck. Nobody could get train capacity because all the truck capacity went to the trains. And so there went the price again. And as we're going through all this, everybody's trying to figure out how they're going to make their money. And that's where the ethical decisions come into place. Because you know people were riding the wave when things were good, and they were charging way too much. And then the pendulum would swing, and they wouldn't have any customers because they rode the wave when, the, when things were good. So then after electronic devices, everybody's heard about our, you know, the good tariffs and the things that are happening overseas. So we started to level out again, and then the tariffs came into place. So traditionally, peak season would come about anywhere from re retail peak season, October, November, December. And uh, the tariffs in, in China were put in place. And so everybody decided to push their imports in way above what traditional years have seen. So then all the capacity last year soaked up in July, June, June July, August. Here again. We don't have any capacity because things are going crazy. So add to that, you've got trucking now is really, really tight. So everybody wants to go to intermodal, but then precision railroading. So 
A good guy named Hunter Harrison comes into CSX and he says, I'm going to do precision railroading. And he says, we're going to uh, go back to the basics. Let's eliminate the network. Let's get down to the core. And so they eliminate a bunch of ramps and they eliminate a lot of pairings. So where it used to be convert truckload to intermodal, it started to going convert intermodal to truckload. But wait a minute, there's no trucks. So this is where you get that erratic nature of pricing. And people, uh, unfortunately, that's where people start to question the ethics. because. You're losing money here, you're losing money here because you committed to your customer a certain rate and you can't buy it for that rate. And then when the time, when it switches, then you're like, oh, well, you can't get a truck, but I found one. It normally should cost $250, but I know you'll pay $800, so I'm gonna charge you $800. Well, let's not be foolish. The customer knows that's happening to them. Unfortunately, they have to pay it because they have to get their goods on the shelf, but they're gonna remember when it sl slides light back. So. <clears throat> One of the things I talk about in pricing is you've got contract pricing, which is steady and sustainable, and then you've got spot market pricing, which is a complete roller coaster. So I consider spot market pricing like Vegas. I don't know if anybody's ever had time to play on load boards, trucking load boards, but it is a nasty business. It is, you know, somebody out there trying to, to work you for the highest price you can get, and then you're trying to work them down for the lowest price. That, and it is all it, it, it seriously is gambling because nobody's going to win in the end. Um, so that's and the problem with spot market pricing is you can make big money and big profits, but it doesn't take care of your customers so much because you're you're eradicating the the price fluctuation and they've got a budget to maintain. So <clears throat> in all the modes of of transportation. It really is just a matter of figuring out what, what can you do ethically to take care of your customer, take care of you, and make sure that you're making the right decisions, kind of back to the statement from Jeff Brashears. So what's the next thing that I thought about in regards to ethical decisions? Um, Backselling and liabilities. <laughs> this really feels like my job, right? Let's, let's go back to the scenario of Valentine's Day and the flowers. Well, let's, the flowers that need to get to the shelf by Valentine's Day come from Columbia. Okay, so let's think about this. What happens if the flowers show up and they are all wilted and dead? Who's responsible for that? I really found it interesting what Dr. Iyer said, and he was talking about all the different points, and this is why I said, do you really want to get in logistics because you make these decisions? Would the responsibility be the freight forwarder that was hired to move the freight from Columbia into Miami? Or would the responsibility be of the steamship line that the container was put on to get to Miami? Or would the responsibility be the broker that was hired to pay the trucker to pick it up from the port? Or would it be the railroad that transported it from the port to the inland location? Or would it be the trucker who picked it up from the ramp and took it to the consignee or here's a good one, would it be the consignee that decided to leave that unit sitting on the dock and didn't unload it in time? And so now you've got seven providers in one move of flowers, and you can't figure out whose responsibility it is, and in our industry it's this. Because there's always a cost associated with it. And nobody has the wherewithal to want to burden that cost because there's so many pieces and parts of the supply chain that you can't figure out who had the liability or the responsibility in it. And so, you know, but the other thing I didn't mention about that, it makes it a little bit more complex, is that's all temp controlled. And so, so um, when looking at that, you know, th that's where the liability comes into it, where the back selling comes into it. It's, it's sad in our industry today because n nobody really wants to work with each other because they're afraid, you know, that, forward, that broker's afraid that forwarder's going to take their customer and they're going to be the lead to charge it. That, that broker's afraid that trucker's going to talk to their customer and they're going to take that business from them. But if you think about it, in our, in our world, so we're a third-party logistics company. We don't have any assets. All we can do is rely on our vendors and our partners and, and, and sometimes our competition. We have competition that we work with all day long that are our partners. And have we been backsold? Absolutely we have. And does it hurt? It does. And that's the ethical part of what we're talking about today. But we're not going to stop partnering with people because if we don't partner with people, we can't be that end-all solution for our customer that helps them get answers every single day for what they need, and that's just getting that product delivered to the final destination. So it, it is an ethical situation, and, and I'm, it, it, 
I'm going to be honest with you guys. I mean, I, I go through my day many, many times and wonder, why can somebody go to sleep at night knowing that they made those decisions? But the other good part about it is you see an awful lot of people, and those are the ones we surround ourselves with, that have the same values and the same, you know, just like you mentioned, Dr. Hart, values and those types of things, that's what you can't miss. And th that's not something concrete. You can't just turn that on and off. I mean, that's something within. So the last thing that we'll talk about, and it's, um, I don't think I have a slide on this. Yeah, this is liability. So the liability um, and pricing, that's the, the other thing I want to talk about. I don't know if, and this is within all supply chains, and it kind of goes back to the, the seven different providers. But it seems like today everybody looks for a way to get out of paying for something. And, you know, there's always a cost of doing business. And I can't tell you how many times it's either getting out of paying an entire invoice or figuring out a creative story of why you can short pay an invoice. And it seems like most of our jobs are spent trying to run and collect and, and look in history of different things to try and figure out how you don't pay for it. And, you know, that's okay. That happens in real life. But I think, what, again, what it comes down to is, is knowledge. And that's what we spend a lot of our time. We, you know, we don't want to chase a truck all day long. We want to really put, facilitate some technology out there that helps our customers kind of look at these gaps and put these pieces together to where it doesn't feel like, I don't want to be doing this because I'm afraid I'm going to be liable. That's what we focus on. We focus on trying to get technology and, we have, and have the knowledge to help our customers and our partners so that you don't run into this. And with the invoicing, the things that you see are all these ancillaries, service prices. You know, everybody thinks that it's just one cost to get from point A to point B. And unfortunately, when things go wrong, there, there's all these little different price points, little different charges that nobody wants to pay. And think about in a situation when you're dealing with overseas customers. It's very, very hard. We deal with a lot of overseas customers on the manufacturing of rail containers. And they'll ask you for a price six to eight months before it's ever even going to move. They want an all-in price. I don't want to pay anything extra. And you tell me how you're going to take it off the ship. You're going to bring it in, put it on the rail. You're going to deliver to my customer. And you know, I'm not going to pay per diems. I'm not going to pay storage. I'm not going to pay any of this. And so that's really hard because things happen in transportation. Things happen in the supply chain. And it, you can't just not pay for the things that happen. But again, it's a knowledge thing. They don't see it the same way that we do. So it takes a long time of just working with customers, working with vendors, and working with suppliers to build the knowledge and get the understanding of what these charges are. So that's the one thing that we spend a lot of time at Intech trying to focus on. So it, in my opinion, really, when it comes to ethics, a supply chain gets tainted when, when multiple parties get greedy. It's, it's not really so much, it, you know, and I don't think it happens as much as what we appear or think that it happens, but when they get greedy or they just don't care. We see a lot of that in the industry where they just don't care, it's all about me. And then that's what impacts the end customer service goal of meeting what your customer wants. So you need to make your, in my opinion, you need to make your customers look good. You need to protect their freight budget, and they'll stay with you. If you ride the wave and get greedy, you are gambling, and your customer will walk away when the pendulum slides. So I've got a couple ending comments. Be intentional with every decision you make in the supply chain. As we mentioned here, it is a complicated, and, and you know, it doesn't seem like it. It, it just is a move. But it is complicated, so you want to be intentional with every decision you make, understand what you're making, and understand what partners you're partnering with. Constantly focus on making your end customer look good, internal customer and external customer. So we always think about our external customer and how to help them and how to satisfy them. But in my office, we couldn't take care of a single customer if it weren't for our internal staff. We've got to figure out how to make them take care of them give them a good environment to work in, and then they will help, in turn, take care of our customer. Um, know the right decision is not always the profitable decision. That one's a hard one for folks, and we see it all the time. Sometimes you have to fall on the sword. Sometimes you got to take a hit, and we've seen it many, many times that the customers or whoever you're working with will see that, and they'll recognize it. And it is, it's for a big win in the end. But if you constantly say no or you constantly, constantly say it wasn't me, or if you constantly do this, then that's not going to work in, in the end, and you're not going to be, you're not going to win. And then strive to go home each day feeling like you made the best ethical decisions for you and your company and your customer. I think it's kind of a theme here, and it's uh, 
you know, I don't know. It, there's a lot of case studies, and there's a lot of things that happen. I could have gone up here and given you a lot of transportation case studies where people were liable for hitting somebody on the side of the road. Unfor unfortunately, things happen in the industry. The best you can do is really all you can do, and you just need to research and be cognizant and intentional about who you work with. And it is fun. It is, I mean, it, sound, it didn't sound like fun as you hear about all these liabilities and the cases and people jumping off of buildings, which was, um, that, that was an interesting start to the morning, Doctor. But um, you know, it, it, it is a fun business, and, there, and I'm interested to see what everybody does on the competition because I think it's neat to throw out, hey, what would you do in a situation like this? So I really appreciate the time, and I think that sums it up.